When I was younger, I had a natural fear of failure. I somehow believed that even God wouldn't accept me if I failed. Then there was a time God taught me some lessons about success and failure and my relationship with Him. It changed my life and gave me a greater freedom than I'd ever had before. Maybe you're struggling with some of the same problems. Well, today on Journey, I'm going to talk about our life in Christ. And you know, I believe it could change your life. Hello, welcome to Journey. Good to have you with us today. You know, too often in our culture, we don't take time to get below the intellectual surface of things. I cringe when one of the late night talk shows goes out on the street to ask some people some really pretty simple questions that, well, you'd think everybody would know the answer to. I'm amazed at how many times they don't know the answer. Recently, a well-known basketball star during a trip to Greece gave an interesting insight as to his knowledge of the Greek culture. When he was asked if he had visited the Parthenon, he said, uh, well, you know, I really can't remember the names of all of those nightclubs we went to. <laughs> Britney Spears attended the Sundance Film Festival. It's known for its more cerebral films, and she gave an interesting comment afterwards. Here's what she said. These films are weird. You actually have to think about them. Well, <laughs> in that context, I hope that our journey today will be different enough to cause you not only to think, but to dig a little bit deeper in your faith. Some of what I'm going to talk about today may sound a little bit repetitious because there's some points I want to keep emphasizing in all of these lessons to make sure you get them. In Paul's letter to the Galatians, in Galatians 2.20, he wrote this, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave Himself for me." Now, the context of this scripture has to do with the inadequacy of the law to provide salvation. Paul makes it clear that we're made righteous by Christ. It's not even in our faith. And I have to really be cautious here because we talk so much about faith. My faith, your faith, and obviously faith is very important. The Bible says without it we can't please God. But we also need to understand this. It is not in our faith that we're made righteous in Christ through salvation, but it is the application of faith in what Christ has done for us. It is not what we do. It is not even our faith, the amount of faith and so forth. It is simply the exercise of our faith that brings us to accept His work on the cross. And it's out of that relationship that flows everything else in our lives. But then again, it needs to be understood that we're not saved or more saved as a result of our works. I don't get more saved by doing good things. I don't get more saved by singing in the choir or helping the homeless. The good things I do flow out of me because of my relationship with Christ. The closer I get to Him, the more I look like Him in word and deed. And then I begin to reflect who He is. But when it becomes a matter of duty, when I'm doing it as a task, when it becomes a matter of works because somehow I feel like I have to do it, then it takes on a completely different meaning. I should be driven by my relationship with Christ and let everything else flow out of that. Paul makes it clear that we are saved by faith and that the law, the things we do, cannot justify us. In Galatians 2, 15 and 16, here's what he says. We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Christ Jesus, that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. So, our relationship with Christ begins with that profound understanding. It is not what we do, it is what He has already done for us. He came, He lived, He was rejected by those He came to save, He died on the cross, and then He was resurrected from the dead. And through that we are justified, not by what we do, but by what He did. And accepting that, by asking forgiveness of our sins and receiving His work on the cross into our lives, 
we're saved. Now, of course, this is not the first time you've heard me say this, and it won't be the last, because it's important that you know it, and it's at the core of our Christianity. It's hard for us to understand because we live in a performance-based world. Usually there are conditions to acceptance. We live in an extremely conditional world. And obviously there are things in our lives that need to be measured. For example, on the job there are expectations and we have to measure up to those expectations. And there are things that God expects of us. For example, He has provided for our salvation and He desires for us to accept it. But in spite of that, His love is unconditional whether I accept it or not. We cannot escape God's love. We can't rid ourselves of His compassion for us. We can reject God's love and die and be eternally separated from Him, but even then He still loves us. It doesn't really make any sense to do that, however, because He's loved us enough to provide a way to be eternally with Him, so we should take advantage of it. Listen to what it says in Romans, the fifth chapter and the eighth verse. But God demonstrates His own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. So that's the condition. We accept God's Son, Jesus Christ. We accept what He did on the cross, the work at Calvary. And when we receive that, we have eternal life through Christ Jesus. And God has made that wonderful plan available to us. But His love is not contingent on whether or not we accept His Son. His love is always there, even if we choose to reject it. But some people misunderstand that and say, well, if God loves us, how could He possibly allow anyone to be separated from Him to go to hell? Well, it's not His choice. It's our choice because God has also made us a free moral agent. So finally, the bottom line is we can choose. He's given us that right, but it has nothing to do with His love for us. A friend of mine who lives in Marin County, California, called me a couple of years ago and told me that his wife had made a decision to divorce him. So I asked him why, what's happened? And he said, well, she said that I no longer made her happy and so she needs to find something else in her life that will make her happy, as if it was his responsibility to make her happy. You know, one of the biggest mistakes we make in marriage today is believing that our partner is going to make us happy. First of all, happy is a subjective term. No one is happy all the time. Happiness has a lot to do with my attitude, has a lot to do with my lifestyle, and to a greater degree than we may think, the way I treat other people. I love my wife, Shirley, and Shirley has done a lot to contribute to the happiness in my life. But Shirley is not responsible for my happiness no more than I am responsible for her happiness. That's too much for both of us to put on each other. What I want more than happiness is the peace of mind that comes in my relationship with Jesus Christ because that's deep and it's settled. But you know, we all have uh, to some degree the pressure and the need to perform. I've struggled with that, especially in my younger years. I had an incredible need to feel successful and I defined success with a lot of external measurements, thinking that I might fail at something just about caused me to hyperventilate. It just seemed like it was more than I could handle. And I, I lived with this fear that I might be considered a failure, and that drove me to do whatever it took, regardless of the time, regardless of the effort, regardless of the hard work, to keep it from happening. But a while before I came to Chicago, God allowed me to go through a time when it seemed that nothing I did worked. It seemed that the harder I worked, the less I achieved. I'd built a pretty good reputation for being a hard worker and a person who could get things done. Things were going well. It just seemed all of a sudden to bottom out on me. Looking back, I realized that much of it had to do with the circumstances, but at the time, circumstances didn't matter. I was not in the frame of mind to accept circumstances. It was a simple matter. You either did it or you didn't do it, and there were no excuses. You had a job to do and you did it. If you didn't do it, somebody else could tough luck. You just didn't measure up. Some of you watching today know exactly what I'm talking about because that's where you are. That was a standard by which I judge my performance. But now, all of a sudden, it wasn't enough, and I didn't feel I was measuring up. I didn't feel I was measuring up with my job, 
with God or anyone else. And my, my entire identity, without me realizing it, had become wrapped up in this perception or this idea of success. But the most difficult thing to deal with was my concept of who God was. Because somehow I had the idea without realizing it that He was some sort of cosmic CEO who was judging me by my job performance. I didn't think God would fire me necessarily, but somehow I had the idea that if I wasn't successful, it would, it would affect how God felt about me. I'd come out of a corporate world of television, and no one there was really concerned that much about who I was aside from my corporate responsibilities. It was pretty much a one-dimensional thing. And somehow I began to put all of this in sort of a strange kind of context that if I failed in my job that somehow I was a failure in every aspect of my life and that ultimately it would affect God's love for me. I thought that if I was a Christian somehow everything should just work and here I was struggling. And it was during that time that God began to do some pretty remarkable things in my life that were essential to my real success as a Christian, and especially for the ministry that He had for me here at TLN. What were those things? Well, I'm going to talk about those right after this. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Journey. Before we went to the break, I was telling you about one of the most difficult times of my life. Well, On the one hand, that year was the lowest point of my career. But on the other hand, I recognized that God was doing something important in my life. And I knew I couldn't run away from it. And that I really had to go through all that God had for me so I could do and allow His complete work in my life. You know, it was interesting, some of the things that happened during that time. One, I was never a clock watcher. I'm still not. I've really never seen 5 o'clock as a quitting time. Getting the job done really is a quitting time. But all of a sudden, not just 5 o'clock, but 10 minutes to 5 was important because it meant I had 10 more minutes before I could get out of the office and into a world that I felt I could cope with. I'd never felt like that before, and quite frankly, it scared me. But it was in that personal crisis when some things became very important to me, and one of those things was my family. I wanted to get home because I knew when I got there, there would be a wife who loved me and accepted me and reinforced me. There were two small boys that would throw their arms around me and love me in spite of all the stuff going on in my career. Now, I'd always loved my family, but much of my focus had been on my career and what I believed would someday be a television ministry. So there's times that they got second best. But then I began to understand how important my family really was to me and how much we needed each other. Shirley became a rock in my life. And I'm not sure she really understands even today how much she meant to me during that incredibly difficult time in my life. So I developed a much deeper appreciation for my family and for their significance in my life. But there's something else that I discovered that in spite of my feelings of failure and struggles with all of my identity during that time, Jesus still loved me. And what I discovered was He didn't judge me by my career. He loved me in spite of all of those things going on in my life. In fact, He loved me even before I accepted Him as my Savior. He loved me when I failed Him in my weakness, and He forgave me when I came to Him in repentance. And now, when I was feeling like a failure in my career, it really took me a while to understand it, but God still loved me. But once I did understand that, I suddenly had a freedom that I'd never experienced before. And it wasn't long before it began to show in my own attitude and, for that matter, in my dealings with other people. I tended to be a lot more relaxed, and I even thought about other people more because I wasn't so concentrating and so centered on, on me and my needs and my success. And I realized that even if I fell flat on my face, Jesus still loved me and that He was there to help me up and get me on my way. Do you realize what an incredible relief that was to me? Because the people I worked for didn't particularly feel that way. For the most part, it really didn't matter if I was a good father or it really didn't matter if I was a good human being so long as I got the job done. 
But if I failed in my job, I was a failure at everything. But Jesus did care, and he was there to help me to become a good father and to become a good human being. So then, when we later came to Chicago, I came here with a greater sense of confidence of who I was, but not only who I was, but more importantly, who God was. And I began to realize that I really couldn't be successful at building this ministry in myself. I would have to have God's supernatural intervention. I could be obedient to the call on my life, and I could work very, very hard, but its success would finally have to come from God. It wasn't all on my shoulders. And it was during that time that I developed a philosophy that I still work from some 30 years later. It's honor God, work hard, and keep showing up. And I've learned that God can take that philosophy and He can do much more through me than I could ever possibly do on my own. The other thing I came to understand was that my ministry was not the only thing in my life. That if everything else in my life was in order, then I brought the best that I had into the ministry to which God had called me. And the two things that are essential, of course, have become my relationship with Jesus Christ and my relationship with my family. When those two things are in order, then I'm able to give my best to the calling that God has placed on my life. But all of it starts with our relationship with Jesus Christ. Oswald Chambers wrote something that I think says it well. The inescapable spiritual need for each of us is the need to sign the death certificate of our sin nature. I must take my emotional opinions and intellectual belief and be willing to turn them into a moral verdict against the nature of sin. That is, again, any claim I have to my right to myself. Paul said, I have been crucified with Christ. He did not say, I have made a determination to imitate Jesus Christ, or he did not say, I will really make an effort to follow him, but I have been identified with him in his death. Once I reach this moral decision and act on it, all that Christ accomplished for me on the cross is accomplished in me. My unrestrained commitment of myself to God gives the Holy Spirit the opportunity to grant to me the holiness of Jesus Christ. It is no longer I who live. My individuality remains, but my primary motivation for living and the nature that rules me are so radically changed. I have the same human body, but the old satanic right to myself has been destroyed. Now, that's a tough saying. And it's really hard for most of us to grasp. We belong to Christ. Our lives belong to Him. Who we are belongs to Him. What we have belongs to Him. You know, I appreciate all of the blessings of God in my life. I appreciate His call to ministry. But the most important thing for all of us is do we know Jesus Christ? Am I infused by the work of the Spirit in my life? Am I submitted to the point that God can work through me? You know, it, it's good to do good things, but it's most important that we're in Christ because without that, those things just become tasks. And when they become tasks, we begin to take ownership. You've seen it happen. A woman quits the choir because she didn't get the solo part, and she's obviously better than the woman who got it. A few years ago, a woman who worked for me uh, felt somehow that it was our obligation to use every single talent that she had, and she was a pretty talented person. But my question to her was, what if we don't need all of your talents? Are you going to force them on us? Or can we, can we just use them as we need them? Can you just make yourself available, and then we'll use the ones that we need when we need them? And though she wanted to spiritualize it, it really was not a spiritual thing. But those kinds of attitudes never are. It was all about her. It was about her needs and what she wanted. The question really is do I know Jesus well enough that the most important thing in my life is to please Him with my life, give my gifts and talents to Him to use as He sees they're necessary? Now, I've shared my mission statement with you before, and it's really pretty simple. To honor God with my life and achieve His purpose for my life. Now, it's an ambitious goal, and I'm not completely there yet. My human nature keeps getting in the way, but it's what I'm striving for. And I hope that it's what you're striving for. 
Paul says in Galatians, the second chapter, the 20th verse, that we should give ourselves to Christ so that He can work through us. Anything that we do outside that relationship is eventually going to be tainted because it's our human nature that's working through us. So how do we give our lives to Christ in a way that He can work through us? Well, Paul struggled with this same question when he said that the things he wanted to do he didn't do, and the things he didn't want to do he did. And that, of course, is the conflict in our carnal nature. We all have to deal with our carnal nature, our biases, our ego, the things that we're defensive about. Paul gives an answer as to how to deal with the carnal things in our lives in Galatians, the fifth chapter, the 16th verse. I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. So, we walk in the Spirit, which is an outflow of our relationship with Christ. When I was younger, I enjoyed sailing. And in sailing, there's a term that I think it's called feathering. I stand to be corrected by a knowledgeable sailor, but that's the term as I understand it. Feathering occurs at that point where you're just about as close to your hull and sail speed as you're going to get. Your tack line is right, and all of a sudden you feel it. It's all come together, and you're close to maximizing your speed in that sailboat. It's an exhilarating feeling. Then you start feathering or just moving the tiller just enough to keep it on that course as long as you possibly can. You don't want to lose it. You don't want to drift off that course. You know, I think spiritual feathering is what Paul is talking about in Galatians 5. There is that place in Christ where we're close to Him. Our service is no longer a duty, it's no longer just a task. It is an inexpressible privilege. We really sincerely want to please God with our lives, and we look forward to that time in prayer because we know that when we go to that time in prayer, He's going to meet us there. There's a sense of closeness in that kind of relationship. It's not performance based, it's relationship based, and that makes all the difference. You know, when I've had some of the deepest struggles in my life, I've been able to go to Him. And every time I've gone to Him in prayer, every time I've submitted that difficulty, that problem to Him, whether it's me alone or Shirley and I as a couple, God has given us an answer. It may have been in prayer, or it may be in reading the Word, but the bottom line is when we have sought God, He has been there to answer us and guide our lives in a way that is honoring and pleasing to Him and helping us to achieve His purposes. And you know what? He'll do the same thing for you. That's what God wants for us. So what have we learned today? Well, we've learned that God always loves us. He loves us even when we fail. He's there to help us through our deepest struggles. And the most important thing in our relationship with Christ is not doing for Him, but being in Him. My prayer for you is the Holy Spirit will apply these truths to your life. Thanks for joining me today, and I look forward to our next journey together. God bless.